Hi everyone, welcome to Plus It's Gaming the Future Book Club Edition. Um, it's a really special one because it's the last one of the series. Um, and so far, many of you have joined. I think a few of you have actually joined every single one of them, which is amazing. Two hours on a Sunday, really congratulations and thanks a lot for giving us so much of your time. And for those of you who don't always join, uh, there's the recordings online. Um, and they usually, they will also be published as our podcast as well. So you can listen to them or you can uh, watch them if you prefer. Uh, today, we are joined by two really wonderful humans, Stuart Armstrong and Robin Hanson. Um, so we really have quite the treat. Um, and we're going to be quite far out there. Um, we already discussed part of this chapter um, when we first kind of wrote to the a book together with a group um, and there we had Andrew Sandberg on a long-term game theory of cooperating with alien intelligences um, for this chapter that we discussed and that was already quite um, yeah quite we, we lean quite out of the window and I think we will do that today as well so very very excited to have Paul Stewart and Robin here today we're discussing the final chapter um, and the final chapter is really about long-term dynamics of intelligent, voluntary, co cooperative games. And so I think we're going to um, discuss not only how to cooperate with um, artificial intelligences, but actually consider our future in space, um, um, our potential future in space as well. Okay, great. So I think that, um, I mean, I guess that both of you uh, need a little of an introduction here in the Foresight group. Nevertheless, if you do want to say a few words just about what got you interested in the topics that you're researching as it pertains to more of the space faring topics, that would be really wonderful. And then I'll launch in with a few questions. From there, we will then take into general book discussion questions. And at the end of the day, we would have to do a little wrap up of like what you guys liked about this book club, uh, how we can improve it, any potential next steps and so forth. But for now, Stuart, I'd love to hear just a few words about what got you interested in the topic that you're working on right now? Okay, well, I was working at the modestly entitled Future of Humanity Institute, which I've now left to go with the much more modestly entitled Aligned AI Company. So um, I, I, I have a knack for modest names, but um, it was actually just a side project that started off initially. It was uh, Nick Bostrom doing one of the his points about how much uh, of the, we might waste the entire future and we're thinking how much of the future would be wasted and everything was already there. Um, the gravitational binding energy to the planets, the, uh, relativistic rocket equation, uh, the various technology, everything was already there, but no one had actually just put it all together, uh, in one thing like me and Anders did and got the spanning the universe uh, paper, which has uh, continued to provide a lots of uh, lots of sub research and uh, conferences like this one. Wonderful. Um, lovely. I will share links to you and to the papers that you just mentioned here in the chat. And then Robert, how about you? Uh, like many of you, I can't imagine that other people don't see the, as, these as the big important questions to ask and talk about. And I'm somewhat amazed that there's even room for someone like me to talk about it, where you might think, you know, some 5% of the world's best thinkers would be all over this and I would just be a little marginal player. So I'm uh, like most of you, I hope it's just obvious. These are the big important questions that we should be talking about them and where, where, what's everybody else think? I don't get that. Okay, and so what specific area within our long-term future in space are you both focused on? Maybe Stuart and Robin, you can just, in a few words, um, you know, outline your hypothesis there. I'm more looking at um, AI now, uh, getting it aligned. So I'd moved down to the short term of, say, 50 years or so, and um, with the other uh, trillion years after that as a consequence of that. So uh, I want to ensure that we survive the uh, AI transition. Is it possible to, um, I don't use LinkedIn much. Is it possible to put a link to uh, uh, the company's website, which is more uh, relevant we'll than do, my LinkedIn? We'll do. <laughs> cool. Thanks. Okay, Robin, how about you? So I've always just thought myself interested in the future in general, 
and opportunistic and trying to find places where things are neglected and I can add things more easily. So for example, you know, early on in interacting with futurists and science fiction folk, it seemed to me that like they neglected social science or didn't understand it so well. So I looked for places where I could combine social science with traditional futurism. And then, then I looked for particular places where the kind of insights I'd collected happened to be able to say something. So I wrote this book, Age of M, which is just about a particular scenario in order to show that it would be possible to say a lot about a scenario like that using social science and the other technical things people understand. And then I've looked a bit at, so I had this paper on burning the cosmic commons and I've thought about sort of long-term value evolution and, and just, uh, and then grabby aliens. And these are just mostly just opportunistic things where I happen to find a way that some tools or insights that I have are neglected. And then I try to apply it to say things. So this is just how in general, all researchers should work in all areas, <laughs> uh, agree in general, what's important and look for where you can make a difference. So obvious, so obvious. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, well, it is, I, I guess, for some, for some people in the crowd anyways, but um, all right. So I think if you want to now tie your work a little bit to bits that we discussed in the chapter, I want to dive a little bit deeper into what you really are working on and how it pertains to the long-term uh, games that we discussed. And Mark, if you have any questions at any point, then please um, feel free to just jump right in. And the same rules for everyone else, just raise your hand. The algorithm is always, um, I st talk as long as, so, so long as you stop me, <laughs> until you stop me, basically. Um, okay. So if you, um, what, yeah, if you had to make your best uh, guess, what, what do you think is your likely prediction for the long-term dynamics that are important for civilization, like our likely long-term path and the dynamics that are crucially important for us to take care of? Very easy first question. Do you want to go first for Russell? I, I, All right, sorry, sorry. No, no, I, I was just trying to put together what I would think would be the most likely scenario. Um, uh, go ahead, Robin, uh, while I think. Uh, please think, I, I approve of thinking before talking. <laughs> well, uh, widely good practice. Uh, so, I mean, obviously if we're talking about the long-term future, there's all this dimensions we could focus on. And each one of us is going to look for the abstractions for which we could say something interesting or useful. So that's what I'm going to do here. And so in my mind, uh, a key abstraction that's relevant, especially with respect to my skills is just this idea of competition or evolution. And a key question is to what extent will the future be determined by competition and evolution as opposed to something else. And so much of my research, when I did have done analysis of the future, it's assuming competition and evolution. That is assuming that, uh, you know, selection will choose what happens. And so that's a powerful tool in the sense that, uh, under selection that you can predict the future, even if you don't know what people want. <laughs> Whereas if you don't necessarily have selection, you have to guess what future people will want. And that's just pretty hard. It's pretty hard to know what people want today and what we want today has changed from the past. So uh, selection is just a really powerful tool. And so age of M is mostly a selection based analysis. Uh, what does selection produce about that world? Averting the cosmos cons is selection analysis. In addition, I've thought about, or just built on the literatures that say what, what uh, time preference selection, risk preference selection, uh, there's literatures on that, uh, and thought about, you, you know, even just evolutionary reproduction preference selection. And I think I can say some interesting things about what selection would do for those things. Um, but you in do say a few things about that. Okay. I will, but I just want to finish the one last piece of summary, which is that in thinking about grabby aliens, i.e. the long run history of the universe. I've realized that lo most likely one of the biggest choices that will happen in the say next few millennia, if not sooner, is that we will decide whether or not to allow competition and selection or not uh, to allow it free reign. And that would produce the difference. I think we would see in the alien, in the cosmic skies between what I call quiet and loud aliens, quiet aliens are the ones out there who, for whatever reason, chose not to allow competition. And in order to ensure that they prevented expansion, they limited the scope of their civilization to some local spatial scope, like the solar system in order to keep the peace and, and prevent change and have the camaraderie and, you know, sense of unity that 
they would like versus the ones that allowed expansion and which then it implies competition and then implies dramatic changes and evolution of the and war even and conflict uh, but also vast you know colonization of vast spaces and then makes a big difference to the universe and um, realizing that that's most likely the two big choices that alien civilizations make. You turn it around to us and you say, that's going to be our big choice. And the model says that the consequence of that choice are about basically whether most of the universe is dead or alive on the scale of the nearest million galaxies and for the next few billion years. Outside of that scope and beyond that time, the model would say it's going to be filled by aliens anyway, either us or them, but that's the scope of the space that our choice makes a difference. And that's a pretty big scope. And so that, that that's my focusing on what I think is sort of the biggest choice humanity and our descendants will make is whether to allow competition and expansion or to prevent it. And um, I, I have my preference, of course, but I'd rather focus people's attention on it happening as a big choice, it's something we can't quite make yet. If we're building up to it, we are making choices that influence it. And it, it will be a difficult choice for people. I think on both sides, there it's a hard choice. There are negative things about both choices. And I would rather help prepare people to think about the choice rather than focus them on my preference. So that's but my uh, summary. And I'm happy to go into detail on any of those things, but I'm yes, not setting the now to Stuart to, has thought to... and is ready to talk. I'd yes. like to, I, I would like to jump in and just challenge a, a few things about that. Um, the you've painted the side you, you that I happen to know you don't like in extremely rosy terms. So kudos for that to to be able to find language for explaining the um, uh, that side in such uh, positive sounding terms. But I think you've gone too far in that. So choice makes it sound like we're collectively choosing in some um, you know, political sense, as opposed to a struggle between forces with one side winning and overcoming the other. Uh, and I think it's much more likely that what we're talking about is the outcome of, of a violent struggle rather than a political decision process. Uh, the other thing that I think is much too rosy about it is what's on the other side of the control side winning of that is that you've got a centralized power that whose major interest is to preserve its central power uh, and once we've got an adequate level of automation the continued existence of non-loyal human lives is not very valuable to that centralized power. So this notion that the consequence of the choice is that we preserve some camaraderie as opposed to mass slaughter of people who are not loyal to the centralized power, I think is also just way too rosy a picture. Um, if, I, if I may okay. respond. Uh, just, oh, okay. I, I'm happy to. I'm happy to grant that. Uh, as a social scientist, I might say the world chooses when war determines the result uh, and conflict determines the result. It's it's not necessarily discussion meetings and votes, uh, but still, it is the the outcome of our various actions that produce the outcome. Um, so I'm happy to to say yes. Uh, you know the word choice there, and yes, I'm I'm happy to elaborate on many negatives about the collective you know li limited growth scenario um I, I think because it's not a selection scenario it is harder to predict how it plays out uh therefore you know i, I do see a wide range of scenarios i can't very i don't think i can very confidently predict that it would be say extermination of humans per se just to preserve a structure uh but that's one of the many things that could happen there um and but the other side i think to a great many people don't quite they have a terror of the actual enormous change i think most of us kind of realize would actually happen uh that we are in some sense more comfortable with the change that would result and for a lot of people the fact that our descendants would quickly become aliens um really terrifies them and aliens who would fight and 
have enormous conflicts on enormous scales forever also terrifies them. So I, I want, I want to be honest about the choice in the sense of being seen as a reliable advice, you know, navigator to this difficult, uh, set of issues, uh, by being, by giving his best case for all the sides. Hmm. Um, yes. So I've thought, uh, um, and I agree that there's a big choice, but I think it's a false dichotomy that is being uh, placed there uh, by putting co uh, competition or evolution and expansion uh, as being on the same footing. The I personally am utterly terrified by that future, not because they'd be aliens, but because of all the mass death and complete lack of choice. The, 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 the chapter argues to some extent that subsistence life does not have to correspond with suffering possible. Uh, uh, we're not, if we're sa if we're saying that we're sort of making some suppositions, but it definitely will, can, uh, will go along with a complete lack of choice by all the entities scrambling to survive and getting immediately pruned and killed. Um, if they make anything that is suboptimal or that's or enjoyable. And, and, but I also agree that, in fact, more strongly, I don't think that uh, humanity or any alien entity is going to stay confined to a solar system. That's not an equilibrium that would function. And it would make sense even from a game theory perspective. It is, even if you've centralized everything, it is still much, much better to grab the universe uh, than to let potential other aliens grab the universe. The game theory, it's not even defection. You can be nice with all the aliens that you encounter, but there's no disadvantage to grabbing the universe first. And that is what I will expect will happen with humanity or humanity's descendants. So it is not so much a choice between expansion or staying or centralization because expansion is going to happen anyway. It's whether there is, it's the degree of centralization whether you have enough centralization to say, allow cooperation across the different groups that are expanding in some automated way, uh, or whether it is, it ends up in the conflict across the universe, uh, scenario, but, and we're talking about growth and resources, but the ultimate resources of the universe are the mass of the stars and the galaxies. That's, uh, there's an estimation paper, which I published with Anders and, um, uh, sorry, I forgot his name for the moment, a uh, guy from Eastern Europe, uh, Milan Sikovic. Um, now I encourage you not to take the thesis seriously. I do not think that there are aliens who are asleep, uh, in the vastness of space. And that explains why we don't see them. Because even if you do that, you would send out probes to harvest the mass. But the point is that if you do that, if you wait, if you wait a mere, what is it, 10 trillion years until things are getting really cold and you can then start partying, uh, with, uh, all the energy and the entropy that you have, that is the biggest collection of resources of the entire possible, uh, the entire, in the entire future of the universe, according to the laws of physics that we know. So an expansion, uh, that if it consumes these resources prematurely, is a colossal waste on a massive scale. So it's not that sort of, you have virtuous evolution and expansion, um, that versus a stultifying staying home, the expansion is going to happen and the conflict-based expansion seems as if it's going to use up the resources of the universe in a very short term and prevent the something probably by a factor of at least a trillion or a trillion trillion more experiences and experiments and adventures, if you want that would be happening, uh, after the universe cools down. So you would say a significant amount of centralization is correlated with more cooperation. Um, it's, 
it sort of depends on whether there is, um, or whether there's a sort of cooperation equation. Like if you consider a market, a market doesn't just happen. A market has to have rules and enforcements and contracts and all that. But once it happens, you get a virtuous competition uh, and cooperation within it. You, you basically don't, so the, the sort of the basic level is you don't want there to be war when groups encounter each other. Because that's just a colossal waste of resources. That would be the most sort of basic amount uh, of cooperation. The whether they have to use their resources just to survive or avoid being conquered is sort of the second level. And beyond that, you can get different levels of cooperation. And if you go all the way to the other end, well, here. It might be a semantic difference. Suppose the universe is controlled by many AIs ruling over different groups of humans that are expanding, uh, and these all ent uh, answer ultimately at some were removed to a single AI on Earth. Now, there are many terrible uh, scenarios you could present in that, but suppose that all that the AIs do is enforce lack of conflict and a certain amount of uh, non-zero sum cooperation. This, this scenario seems good enough that it is, I feel, worth aiming for. Um, so part of it, it's sort of whether, can you define what you want insufficient how do you I, there's a question there how do you cooperate across thousands of light years um there are lots of ways of doing asynchronous cooperation the the main thing is that when the first groups your if groups encounter each other there are certain protocols you you can't get perfect 100 percent positive sum cooperation without communications across that but if you have protocols for how to interact like even just say the first person on a solar system claims it as say the very first, uh, uh, tr as a tradition, say would avoid a lot of conflicts and help simplify things. But it's like you have protocols for who owns a ship. If you find it at sea or various things, which maybe if you had the full powers of the government negotiating, when there's these three people stumble upon the ruins. They would come to a different agreement, but you have sort of local protocols that you then can pass back and forth uh, at different levels. Um, so this is this is a bit. Can I just from the? I just want to question. Up. I said thousands of years because in general societies don't last that long. So how do you cooperate when the round trip communication time is longer than the lifetime of a society? Um, this is why I'm thinking of AI um, quite strongly. This uh, setup is if you have AI enforcement of, say, meta rules or the galactic market or whatever equivalent of that, that can last far beyond uh, uh, societies. And I also expect that one way or another, societies are going to get more frozen uh, in the future, because people, people are going to get more frozen as we get more power to, ch to affect our own opinions and lock them in and societies will also uh, have the power to lock in their current social structures as well. Um, and yeah, so I fear, fear, yes, I, it's not ideal, but I do think that, uh, that societies are going to become much more stable and people are going to become much more stable over the future, unless we design deliberately to avoid that. And I have some ideas on that, but they're sort of more controversial. Well, we would love to hear them if you want to share and then we'll take Steve and Robert. Yes, I know. Okay. Um, so the idea, yeah. the, the idea don't, is don't, don't just, shy away from, don't shy away from more controversial here. Okay. Um, 
the basic idea is um, if you have the reason it's sort of controversial is that it combines AIs in position of extreme power and influence and manipulation of society with freedom of choice of humans and diversity and change in the society. Uh, that could only work if you can get the algorithm's goals aligned with that purpose. But if we can define what kind of diversity we would like and within what parameters we would want this uh, to, to vary, very colossally broad by today's standards, uh, maybe a bit narrower by the standards of everything that's possible. But if we can define that, it, it's basically, the reason why it's controversial is because if you say it in human terms, this would be a, a point of virtuous tyrant who will make sure that everything is nice, which is stupid and fails. Um, if algorithms though do not have either the strength or the weaknesses of human rulers, and if we can define this goal, if we can write out that goal, then it may become possible. What can be measured can be made. Great. Okay. I, I, I did a sort of short story uh, once called The Adventure, set in a sort of fictional utopia along the lines of what I would imagine this being. I designed it to be a utopia that I'd like to live in, which is not what most utopias um, are. Um, yeah, I could put a link to that if you want. Yeah, that, what that is it called? A more thought experiment. Uh, the Adventure, it's on Less Wrong. Um, okay, I'll it throw was, it here. I have had a, very few people tell me they found it utterly brilliant. And a lot of people who have not commented on it at all, from which I conclude <laughs> that they didn't like it much. Okay. Uh, well, I'm dying to read it. I will, um, yeah, I will, I'll share it here in the chat. Okay. We have Steve who had his hand up for a while and then Robin who already said a few points of potential disagreement, which is exciting. Okay. Steve, you go first. Uh, thanks. Great discussion. Um, I have a question for Robin. That's actually quite related. I think to what Stuart was saying, um, Robin, you framed the kind of dichotomy that the humanity faces as either staying, say, local to a solar system or becoming a grabby alien that just takes over everything and converts it to us. And I'm wondering if there's some kind of an intermediate niche, which I've been thinking of as sort of anti-grabby, uh, which is that we expand, uh, but our only, we, we tread lightly on the expansion and our main goal is to prevent other grabby aliens from arising. And so we sort of let things happen the way they want to, unless they start looking like they're going grabby and that's when we intervene. Is that stable? Is that something reasonable? Is that something in your thinking or, or not? So, so that's related to the question AI posted on the three key questions. Uh, my initial reaction or take is that if colonists expand out into the universe without say political officers off on board, <laughs> or sort of mind engineering that's changed them and limited them somehow to follow some central directives that they are actually independent creatures who can evolve independently and have full freedom and opportunity to do so, then it's hard for me to imagine uh, coordinating that universe, except via, as they interact, they choose to coordinate. But uh, if if the expansion wave is past, you know, happening at say a third speed of light or something, uh, it's just very hard to imagine coordinating uh actively with say those near the frontier of the expansion way from the center in the sense that it's really hard to like hit them with anything to threaten them <laughs> you, you can offer them information or not and they can offer you information a lot but there's not very many other threats you could make and so it seems like evolution would then take selection would take over they would make choices that are locally beneficial and then those would dominate so the question is can, so that is your question steve that is can you come up with a scenario <laughs> whereby expansion happens, but is controlled or coordinated more than you might expect if it was just, you know, unconstrained competition. And so again, political officers are one scenario that you can imagine before anybody leaves, they're all embedded with political officers who are monitoring them for deviation from the orthodox approved uh, strategy. Uh, 
or that like, they have hardware that goes along with them that contains protocol officers. It's not in their mind or something and it limits their, their actions. Uh, but otherwise how I, I, I struggle to imagine how, how you could prevent those on, on the frontier of a colonization wave from doing whatever maximize their local reproductive benefits as they saw it. Um, that be, it's just, you know, I just can't imagine that, but please tell me, tell me how we could do that. <laughs> Um, may I make a, just a very short point that I don't expect that it'll be humans at the front edge of the colonization wage. And I didn't say humans. Mm -hmm. uh, but I fully expect about... artificial creatures, very artificial creatures. Nevertheless, how? But they don't require political officers um, to keep them in line necessarily. These don't evolve with, uh, according to the same rules that humans do. They may have goals that they want to achieve and want to keep those goals stable right. and the ability to do that. But if people going in different directions can just have different goals, then there's a competition between goals. Then select the goals. There's a selection among the goals. There's not a central source of the goals. What prevents competition among different goals? Um, so, so, sorry, I, I just wanted to, I, I don't want to dominate the conversation there. Um, so I'll. I'll wait till other people speak before answering that, if that's okay. I think we'd love to hear from you unless Mark, you want to chime in. I just want to point out that, that, um, there's some, there's a, some overlap with, and, um, the, one of the, the more difficult things we talk about in the book is the notion of active shields is the notion of, um, uh, a multipolar uh, enforcement mechanism that inf enforces a basic framework of volunteerism, uh, and that this, if the way in which this thing is deployed is such that any expansion carries the framework with it, then you know there's a there's a very fuzzy line between that and you know, Robin's political officers, or uh, uh, you know, a way to characterize what what um, uh, one end of what Stuart was talking about, or uh, Eliezer Yudkowsky talking about the pivotal act. Uh, but the the thing that's different, I think, in the way in which we're conceiving of the active shield system, uh, is that it's just trying to achieve and enforcement of volunteerism uh, and leaving, and, and, and admittedly, that is not a simple and unambiguous and objective goal. There's, there's lots of subtleties and judgments and policy choices just in terms of what do we mean by volunteerism? I don't want to, to underestimate that. But the idea is that that's the only universally enforced framework that you need to enable the, the interactions then within all the parties within that framework to be co-op, to generally be cooperative and wealth building rather than um, violent and negative sum interactions. But Mark, you agree that if, colonists go out there without that framework, they, they like that framework, then it's competition and evolution and selection. Right. So, so what I'm saying is, so first of all, yes. Uh, so the, so the, the one way to characterize uh, the choice that I, that I'm painting with regard to active shields is what framework of evolution are we talking about? Uh, generally, when we say evolution, we're thinking biological evolution, which is dominated uh, by predation and violent conflict. Uh, and then what's, what our civilization has brilliantly done uh, through many mechanisms is created a ecosystem of interaction within civilization that's dominated by voluntary interaction. Uh, uh, and, and one of the characteristics of voluntarism that I think is more, most clear is that a voluntary interaction is one that you can choose not to engage in. Um, whereas 
a, a bi the biological evolution is dominated by interactions that one of the parties to the interaction, the prey would have preferred not to engage in the interaction, but it didn't have that choice. Um, so, uh, so the idea is that a, a basic minimal neutral framework of voluntarism preventing involuntary interactions uh, enables the maximum decentralized creativity and set of choices and evolution within that framework uh, uh, dominated by cooperation and building of knowledge and wealth and adaptive complexity and problem solving capability because of the shift from the biological predation framework to the cooperative mutualism framework. This is the kind of outcome that I would see as a definite victory, uh, personally. That you would see as what? Could you say this again? As a, as a victory. As a victory. Uh, <laughs> as a success uh, for uh, humanity and uh, our various descendants. And it's, there's someone brought up, um, uh, uh, not good arts law. Uh, and, um, this, yes, you have to measure this in a sense, the whole alignment problem is, can you defeat good hearts law, um, well enough, uh, that you can define these things so that they do, that they are sustainable. Um, but as I said, say, say what, what good hearts law is. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Good hearts law is that when a measure becomes a target, it ceases to be a good measure. So, um, if you reward the, the examples, this is the example that everyone gives, but I've not found the original. Um, but the example that everyone gives is of the Soviet factories where there were nails and you were you were rewarded by the number of nails that came out. And, um, so they produced tiny slivers of useless metals, uh, en masse. Um, but it's not a, um, it's not inevitable, like targeting GDP, for example, uh, for all its, um, laws is not very good heartable because it might be in the interest of one company that interest rates be higher or lower, but it's not in their interest to take the dive to report or to do the sales up and down in order to try and influence what the interest rates will be down the line. So, um, there are, there are things that are not easily good heartable or that require coordination to good heart, but the best way of getting around it is to be able to define things properly. Yes. Okay. Adam. Yeah. Yeah. No, for a while. Yeah, I, it doesn't directly relate to what Sue just said, but I'll go ahead anyway. It's, it's okay. Okay. And yeah, it's just a general philosophical statement, which is, um, this question of how urgent it is to, you know, enforce cooperation versus taking a more libertarian approach, um, seems to depend on how big the negative externalities are of people doing uh, what, what they're going to do. And that in turn seems to depend at least in part on like facts about the laws of nature that we don't know at the moment. Um, so just as an example of that, um, there are these proposals that future civilizations will want to make super efficient power plants using highly magnetized black holes that can just basically eat anything that comes in and just spit out pure energy on the basis or, uh, you know, destroying all baryons and, and the like. Um, pretty much that'll be the most efficient thing you could do. And so you'd be highly incentivized to do it, uh, locally for yourself, um, except that it has a negative externality, which is, or maybe depending on the laws of physics that we don't quite yet know, uh, which is that it can destroy everything in your future light cone by destabilizing the Higgs vacuum. But it's probably very unlikely to do that according to what we currently understand. So any individual will be incentivized to do it, but the negative externality would be uh, pretty catastrophic. So if that does turn out to be the way that our laws of nature are sort of arranged, then I think like it makes international, you know, intergalactic cooperation considerably more 
urgent and enforcement because you're going to have to stop people doing things that are locally in their interests because locally the risk of of this bad thing is so low it doesn't really bother you but integrated across every bin it affects it's going to be massive would anyone like to respond to this Robin, Mark or Stuart um yes but Robin's had his hand up uh for some time. I, I just want to comment on that. I don't know how you enforce across thousands or millions of light years. Well, I think it's it's tricky. The but, I mean, there have been some discussions of ways to do it. So uh, the question is how big is the incentive to do it? I think there are some more, less speculative large reasons for coordination across call scales. So even if that doesn't turn out to be true, we can point to other big gains from coordination. Adam, could you elaborate on a few avenues for how one could enforce that? Well, I was letting the speak. I mean, I was just giving a, a motivation. Um, you know, we've heard about political officers. We've heard about other other things. Yeah, no, it, I think political officers is an idea we should definitely retire, uh, mainly because I expect that people will start, as soon as people can start hacking their own um, preferences, we will, they'll settle down into a local equilibrium at some point, there'll be attractor states and people's views and values will just stop varying as much as they do today, um, w without needing any enforcement. This is just a natural consequence of, um, when people can start freely hacking their opinions for the long term and. Basically, you they've been all they, we're going to all fall into attractors of one sort or another. And those but attractors are naturally right? cooperatives. Sorry. And those attractors are naturally ones that cooperate a lot. No. No, I was just saying that. That I was not making a point about that. Um, you 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 could, but the for the avoiding say dangerous physics experiments. Um, it's if you can have enforcement enforcers or things that entities that check on what's going on and are limited to in what they do that's sort of the scenario i did at the beginning the idea of algorithms threaded throughout the human expansion with limited goals uh, that include cooperation and they would also presumably include not destroying the universe as part of their uh, remit. But yes, that, that would be, that's a big question. Can you get algorithms, AIs of great power that are nonetheless limited and constrained in their goals and desires such that humans continue to have choice and freedoms and the algorithm can stamp out on, say, only the most egregious, difficult experiments, uh, like those ones with magnetic black holes, but not on others. And I feel that it's kind of going to happen because that scenario is very close. Well, if that fails, if it cannot be done, I don't think that you can make an AI that is safe for humans in general. Um, so in a sense, it has eh, caveats. There's certain scenarios, but I think they are of low probability. But I basically think that you have to be able to create algorithms that are safe and allow human flourishing, even when the algorithms have basically all the power just because if we fail to do that, um, we won't be able to create algorithms that are safe at any level of realistic power. Robin, do you want to comment? Uh, yes. So, so it, it seems to me like uh, Mark has talked about framework spreading out and uh, Stuart's talked about algorithms spreading out. But the, you don't want to call those political officers fine, but in some sense they are something other than what would have been the default without them mm -hmm. by which things happen differently, right? And so the key question is, uh, will there be an expansion without those 
such that uh, you did not set those in at the, at the beginning stage and you've got this expansion that lacks those. Can you retrofit that onto such an expansion? That seems hard to me. Uh, and then the other question is whether, whether there would be an expansion at all or whether or not that would be prohibited. So I, I think most of people here are inclined to just think that's crazy, ridiculous, and, and just a terrible plan. And you have to sort of put yourself in the head of the other people out there <laughs> who are in the sort of the middle of the political power distribution and what they think. And I think, you know, there is a substantial risk of that. I think, you know, it's quite plausible that that's, you know, at least 50, 50 chance. Um, so I, I think what you don't, you have to realize is, uh, you know, basically the, the two main principles for predicting future values are either selection. There's some process by which selection changes values, or you have momentum of current values. <laughs> That is, people continue to express and act on the values they have now, and those continue to to be realized. And that those current moment, those that current momentum could sort of, if it so chose, create these frameworks or algorithms and then spread them. But it would have to decide that it wanted to do that. Um, and you know, the way history up till now is going is that um, we had you know steadily increasing scales of organization, steadily increasing scales of governance. And over the last half century, we've had consistently stronger, I'd say, world mobs or a, co a coherent world community of opinion that has uh, approved and created a lot of very sort of globally coherent regulatory frameworks that are quite constraining. So if you look at a lot of areas of regulation, say, nu you know, nuclear power, elect you know, electromagnetic spectrum, uh, medical experiments, et cetera you'll find that all across the world, they do it pretty much the same way, not because there is a central world government, but because there is a world community wherein each group of experts in each country wants to be respected by that community. And then there's gossip in the world and, and status and people basically are doing these things all the same way all across the world. And that's becoming slowly stronger and that will eventually lead to stronger governance. But we are already in a world that is not allowing just competition and evolution and selection to, to make things happen. We're already greatly constraining what can happen in the world through a global community, global mob like that. And if you talk to many of those people in that world, you talk to them about unconstrained technological evolution or unconstrained expansion, they are horrified and oppose it. And for example, even in, in our world, people have talked about the, the long reflection or something where they say, let's just make sure we don't allow any substantial changes for a few 10,000 years or whatever until we really think it all through and make sure we're making the right choice here. And uh, there's just a lot, of, a lot of opinion that likes that. And so once people real, once that world realizes that the moment they allow somebody to leave unconstrained without any algorithm or political office or anything, that that regime is over and that they will then face the descendants of those colonists who come back and compete with them, that will be the moment where they will either ban that or they will have to approve some regime like you guys are talking about where there's a political officer or, or algorithm or framework or whatever you want to call it that lets things go but controls them, keeps them under control. So, and those are the three choices, really. That Those are the three options, and the question is, where is the political will? Where will it go? And when I'm trying to predict political outcomes, I shouldn't ask, what do I want? Or what are my friends like? I should ask, what does history seem to show? Where is the, you know, most of the support and opinion in the world today and try to project that forward? One should, so there, there's a descriptive question and there's a prescriptive question. Uh, and I agree with Robin that we should start with the descriptive question, um, which is, uh, what seems to be the balance of probabilities of what will happen under different sets of assumptions. But the, the, the question that many of us are trying to figure out an answer to is not primarily the descriptive question. It's primarily the prescriptive question, which is, what should I do? And I want to bring into the conversation um, a triage orientation that I got from David Friedman that has really helped me think about uh, how to bridge from the descriptive issue to the prescriptive issue, which is 
we're in a position of tremendous uncertainty about how the future will unfold. Um, none of the methodologies that, that Robin laid out are terribly reliable. Uh, new factors, like in particular, uh, in the book, of course, we focus on crypto commerce, the rise of cryptography as being able to create a sudden change in political trade-offs that lead things into a different direction than one would expect from trends. Um, uh, but there's all sorts of things that maybe none of us know about that could shift things in yet another direction. So we're in a position of tremendous uncertainty. Given this tremendous uncertainty, there's one part of the probability mass in which um, uh, if the reality is like that, then no matter what we do, the future turns out wonderful, and it doesn't so much matter what we do. There's another part of the probability mass um, that says things are so terrible, the feedback loops that lead to, to disasters, the, you know, the, the great filter, uh, existential risk, AI ruin stuff, that the, the dynamics are so terrible that it's all hopeless and no matter what we do we're all doomed anyway and we don't know whether we're in one of those two worlds or we're somewhere in the middle where what we do matters when we think about what to do it makes sense to approach the uncertainty of what kind of world we're in from a triage perspective and say, okay, let's say we're somewhere in the gray area between those two prob probability masses where what we do makes a difference in how the future unfolds. And then the question about what we should do is only to be answered within that range of scenarios. Uh, yeah, that makes sense to me. Um, but then you still want to say, if you're in the middle where you might be able to do something, you're still want to say, what's the most likely world there? What does the rest of the world think? What yeah. are they inclined to do? And ask how on the margin could you move what they would, would be likely to do if we did nothing well, to, yes. Uh, yes. You know, so rather than yeah. make up your own favorite world, ask what's the most likely world that's in that middle and how could we react with, or interact with that world? Yes, I agree with that completely. And I want to point out that that's a very, very different probability question than the overall probability of what is likely to happen. And this is why um, I keep on bringing up AI continuously, because it seems that the challenge that you need for some kind of cooperative framework that expands to the universe is very similar to which and enabling human flourishing is very similar to the challenge of what you need to get a successful AI transition on earth. And algorithms would, uh, artificial entities would reach the stars far before the human uh, waves uh, would do so. So what happens to algorithms and in AI and whether we can align them and how uh, they're aligned seems much more important for determining this question than human political institutions for the moment. Because I agree our deception whether... is artificial and, and M's and artificial. And, but the question is what about the fact that M's our descendants will be artificial helps us in figuring out the answer to this question. The mere fact that they're artificial by itself doesn't seem to say that much. Well, whether if AIs can cooperate with each other, if they can have stable utility functions in the ways that humans can't. Um, if they can, if all these goals that are what is good for humanities can be spelled out sufficiently to enable, to, to control a super intelligence on earth, if that scenario comes to pass, it is the same of what would be needed to enforce this across the stars. So some people described that, made the claim that AIs are just naturally much more cooperative than humans under the assumption they can read each other's code and completely determine how us, another piece of code would determine all its actions. And that seems just fantastical to me. I, I just don't buy that as an explanation it's, for why AI is not more cooperative. It's not impossible. Um, I mean, 
And that's a, that's I, a pretty I low standard, not impossible. <laughs> Um, and, but also consider that uh, a algorithms or AIs might make themselves more transparent, uh, to each other, if that's in their advantage. So if you have different entities making so, themselves mutual, I mean, already nations can say nations can say us and Soviet union could make more peace with each other. If they could make their internal governance processes more transparent, that is something they tried to do to some extent, but it was a limited degree. It's just a limited degree to which you could take a solar system size entity and make it transparent to outsiders. I mean, if, if most of that complexity matters for what it does, it's just going to be really hard for outsiders to, to figure out the consequences of all that complexity for everything it might do in every situation. If, I, I think if there the US mixed, was, oh. I think there are Sorry. mixed scenarios that, um, get at more of a sweet spot. Um, uh, a unpredictable, um, subtle chess playing computer that, that where we can't predict what moves it will make can be constrained by a legal move checker to only make legal moves. And one can verify this very, very tiny proof checker and set up an architecture and have the proof checker be transparent and open and set up an architecture where this big, opaque, unpredictable, unanalyzable move maker can only bring about its effects after verified by the proof checker. And then in that architecture, only the proof checker needs to be transparent and the, the arrangement such that the proof maker has to operate through the proof checker is sort of the minimal additional verification needed. And that's also true for humans. Any sort of mechanisms like that would also work fine to help humans cooperate. They, it isn't specific yes. to AI. Yeah, but human and, 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 and this oh. is what a lot of the blockchain institutional arrangements are, is to take some amount of code, run it on the blockchain where it's inspectable, uh, and then have tremendous activity off of the blockchain coordinating with each other through the arrangements on the blockchain. And those arrangements can be tremendously simpler than the entities interacting through it. Um, I think um, I disagree with Robin that this is likely to be that um, algorithms are very similar to humans. Humans, we have many, many um, quirks coming from our evolution, uh, strange behaviors uh, that we can't stay constant. For instance, we, when we stick with a promise or an ideology, we do it within certain parameters. Nobody stays loyal to their ideology forever without feedback, but nor do people sort of abandon long held ideas at the drop of a hat. There are we are working within parameters of some of which Robin sketched himself with status and those sort of things. Algorithms do not need to follow any of those assumptions at all. They can be unchanging if you want them to be completely unchanging. They can change in particular ways if that is what's required. Um, I don't think the analogy with humans or even with evolution is particularly um, useful when thinking of what you can do. Like you said that the USA and the USSR didn't make themselves optimally transparent, but these are mass entities of people and institutions and different objectives. If the USA was a single algorithm, uh, with a single central goal, it could make itself transparent if it felt like it or not, if it didn't, that's there is a crucial difference between the space of all possible minds and the space of minds that we happen to have found ourselves in. Uh, let me just a moment to reframe. My claim would be, you know, what we actually have is a vast space of governance mechanisms that's hardly been explored. We are at risk of freezing in on a limited set of governance mechanisms on earth through a world government that's, that's slowly congealing and not exploring this wider space of governance mechanisms. And they would lose out on the possibility of all the things we might be able to do better and better with better governance mechanisms. 
I don't think AI is especially important as a way to produce better governance mechanisms, but it's one of the knobs you can turn. But I, I would say the key limitation is what we need is lots of ex small scale experiments with the many good governance mechanisms, ideas that are out there so that they can seem, you know, be proven and then go up to larger scales. And it's a, it's a time race for it is whether that will happen in time before the world government we form will be, will have a particular structure and then people won't actually be very willing to, to swap it out for a different a structure with a very, something with a very different structure. So that's, I would think the actual race we're in is to actually do experiments with alternative governance mechanisms, show that their capability, and then try to convince the world to use those instead of what they're likely to use instead. I did share your post on uh, world government risking collective suicide or civilization of suicide just here in the chat. If people want to check that out, I thought that was quite um, intuitive. And, and Judy, you had a wonderful point in the chat. Would you like to make it? I think we can't hear you. Unmute yourself. Okay, do, can you hear me? Okay, oh, I'm, uh, I'm like with Patrick. <laughs> Just there, sorry. Uh, it's, uh, it's only an, a tiny point because uh, if we, if, I think if we start to think in one way of the, algori of the algorithm and we, uh, go through the path and if we forget something i just want to say that evolution patterns are very complex and there is a lot of interaction uh, a very a mixity of and diversity of interactions and i think the predator model and violent is a human id the predator pre model is one this one is great it's functional but is not the one, the only one is the, maybe the first thing we, we learn in biology, uh, general biology, there's mutualist, same views this. And I think we are better to, to keep this in mind, because I think if we, uh, trap ourselves in, um, in one model and the violent predator model, I think that that will be the way. Uh, where we will go. Uh, there's a self-fulfilling prophecy effect. If we, if we all believe that, we will realize that it's the human power to, 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 to create and realize the, the world and the future that it believe in. So I just want to keep to maybe an um, human, humanity, human is very um, plastic, is very um, cultivable. <laughs> it's a... Um, it's uh, we can do a lot of wonderful thing with things with human, with culture. Uh, we can design personalities, a, a diversity of personalities. We can we can go with cooperation, but it's not forced. It's it must be cultivated, and 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 for that you are you need to have a, a great understanding of the complexity of human of humanity. Um, so it's uh, not trap ourselves in the in the one model. Uh, it's not the future when I and my kids want to live a predator violent model. So it's what I'll yeah. um, sorry for me. Thank you. Duard or Robin or Mark, would anyone like to comment? So I, th I think that um, what we, vi the, the concept of violence is certainly a human invention. I mean, it's part of human language. But I think what we observe happening between predators and prey, I think calling that violence and saying it's, it's essentially the same phenomena as violence amongst humans is accurate. Um, and I, th the, I think the, and certainly biology has plenty of symbiotic relationships, plenty of relationships other than predator prey. And, you know, this, and, and many of those are wonderful. Uh, to my mind, the, the the crispest criteria that separates the essential rules of our civilization that we've you know that we've built as a new level of abstraction out of biology uh, on top of biology the central difference is the ability to choose not to interact a you know producer consumer 
only make a trade if both parties want to engage in the trade, uh, whereas the prey has no choice to not engage in the predator-prey relationship. I'm, I'm happy to join Mark in pointing you toward thinking of the difference between voluntary and involuntary interactions as a fundamental way to think about how to make useful distinctions. But I would argue that the actual distinction in most humans' minds is not that one. And we need to understand what's actually going on in people's heads to really understand the, the momentum here, what's, what's the trajectory. And I, my story is that, you know, the biggest thing that ever happened to humans was humans differentiated themselves from other primates by having forager social groups that were bounded by gossip and cooperation and consensus and the ability to leave. And then farming showed up and farming was only possible because humans had this, you know, cultural plasticity that allowed us to change our values. But farming was much more like prior primate competition and violence and inequality. And humans adapted to that for 10,000 years because we could. But as we've gotten rich over the last few centuries, my main claim is we have been drifting back to forger attitudes and styles. And in the forger mindset, the outside world, there is this world that naturally is violent and has conflict like other primates would or the other farmers would. And that what saves us from that is our ability to come together, talk, make collective decisions and implement them together via social shaming, gossip and status. And that is sort of how humans think of how we protect ourselves from the great wild out there that would otherwise be violent and conflicting and make us evolve into strange aliens. And so that's what's happening right now is that we are getting richer and we are more invoking the forager mindset and styles. And so we are creating this global mob, the global community that has shared senses of what's right or wrong and what should be done and status, which is enforcing around the world our collective judgment about what sort of things should not be allowed and what sort of changes and exploration should not happen. And that's going to continue over the coming centuries. And that's what we have to convince to allow expansion and uh, evolution and voluntary changes that might be radical because that world is not so inclined to allow a lot of such things. That's the actual alternative in people's heads. So, you know, the picture you paint is, you know, in many people's minds, there's this natural world of violent conflict and destruction. And we humans overcome that. And how do we do that? We do that by talking to each other and forming an agreement and then shaming anybody and, you know, repudiating anybody who doesn't agree with our shared concept. And that's how we have prevented that. But that's the momentum that is taking us toward a world government that I think plausibly might not allow expansion exactly because it fears that as the consequence. Stuart, would you like to come as well? Uh, Steve had his hands up. I just, okay. Uh, well, I book my bed. Steve, you go. Okay. Uh, I was going to take us in a slightly different direction. Actually, it's quite related. That's okay. We can go on tangents. <laughs> so I'm now trying to imagine, uh, let's say we went full grabby. We decided, you know, uh, we're not going to put up with all this nonsense. We're going to take over all, all resources, expand as fast as we can, and really, you know, build the best uh, computation engine and just, you know, make a, a sphere growing at some big fraction of the speed of light. What does that look like? What, what do we do internal? Now we have all this computation available. Um, we've solved all the problems of dealing with physics and of dealing with most uh, competitors. Uh, what do we devote that, that, that computation to? Do we develop within that some kind of free thinking, uh, wonderful society of interacting agents or do we do something else? What, what are your thoughts on that? <laughs> To Bill, to Mark made the point before, it's not, I mean, just to be clear, it would be if any one of us managed to escape the entire rest of society trying to prevent us and slipped out and started that, started that world. That's how that world would start, right? It wouldn't be because we chose it all. It would be mainly because somebody defied everybody else's wishes and made it happen anyway. And then what would happen is that in that world, each small part of it would not actually have much influence over how civilization developed. Each small part of it would be focused on how it could survive and thrive. And it would be looking locally opportunistically for all the different ways it might find an edge over its competitors. And that's how that world plays out. So we could say, what does that result in? But it wouldn't be because they had a plan or a vision for how they were going to make their world. That's not how that world evolves. And so again, 
but that's why we could predict what it would be. So I would say the, the reason why we could tell you about the world is because we don't need to know what those people want to tell you what that world looks like, because all we have to do is look at what they would pick as their, you know, reproduction maximizing strategy. And that's what they, we predict they will do, whether they like it or not. And I think there are a bunch of things we can predict about what that world looks like in those terms, but it's still pretty hard, pretty hard but at least though. you have a chance. I, I don't think that uh, the someone slipping away is going to be how expansion starts. Expansion is going to start the, the centralized government. If it appears, it's going to start this expansion itself precisely to prevent that. If AI comes sooner, the AI probes will start the expansion. It's yeah, it's not going to be uh, the idea that you can maintain a lock in locked in civilization over 200 years, um, from now, uh, seems ludicrous. Uh, I mean, I could be convinced, uh, that, um, uh, that it might be the case, but I'm not expecting. Yeah. So the, the sort of mixture of technologies that you have a dominant system, powerful enough to control all of humanity. And yet some independent agents has access to technology that can allow them to expand, um, that does, this seems a very far-fetched scenario compared with the more likely ones that the central governments or government or governments will start expanding themselves or that we can find sufficiently small algorithms to put on probes that we can shoot out at speeds that no humans can match. Oh, okay. I see. Sorry, I just found the hand raising and, uh, it's quite all right. You're on the speaker panel anyway, so I have my eye on you. <laughs> um, Robin, do you want to react to this? Cause your worldview is quite different. I've just, just connected to our prior discussion, right? So a world government that's afraid of unconstrained expansion out there. Uh, one strategy is just to lock down the borders and prevent anything from leaving and shoot anything that looks like it's leaving. Right. Another strategy like you might suggest is to preempt that by causing an expansion, but now it has to worry about whether it can control that expansion. And so that mm -hmm. brings us back to the issue of whether it's possible to control such an expansion. Remember the central government might be, not be that competent, <laughs> might be that co mm -hmm. well coordinated and might not be that wise. And it might know that. <laughs> and so can it send out, you know, control algorithms or frameworks or political officers or whatever that, that is this big question. Is that even a feasible thing? Cause remember. If you send this thing out and, and you don't, you know, it has bugs in it, it's wrong. You know, there's a, there's a lot of security surface area as, as Mark might point to there, right? You, you allow millions of reproducing things to go out there and supposedly you think you control them. Well, how big a mistake do you have to make before you have failed? That's precisely one of the reasons that I think that even a central government would do that, um, because. This is the kind of thing that sounds really great. And yes, we, we've passed our algorithms through all the tests. Um, so it'll be perfectly safe and the tests have been run by my nephew. So it's all, it's all okay. But yes, what I'm saying is that I do not see the scenario of a single dissident or small groups of dissidents escaping from government control as being a uh, one that is very likely to happen at all. It will be some large entity doing it. Um, but it's if a large entity it, mostly succeeds, but fails in a few places and that's how failure happens again. And it's a few dissident, you know, deviant things. There's a, a hundred thousand government ships go out each from the official government agency. And one of them fails to be controlled properly. And it allows uncontrolled expansion that it produces the future. And that's the dissident that causes it. If you want to cause that, call that a dissident. Yes, I have uh, situation then. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so, so isn't there an example where that worked, which is China and the, whatever it was, 13 or 1400s decided not to send ships out on the Pacific and the emperor was able to enforce that for hundreds of years. Uh, yes. And there's the Tokugawa that locks Japan down and I'm pretty sure there have been isolated scenarios in other situations as well. On the cosmological scale here, on the, on the scale of say the gravity aliens model of the rest of the universe, 
The question is, can you lock that down for a hundred million years? A uh, hundred years is not a hundred million, right? And as, as the civilization grew and got more technology advanced, it would be a smaller chunk that would be capable of sneaking off and starting something else, right? And so- Yes, but, but the resources to do that are large and that makes it easier to control than if you could do it in your garage. Uh, if if a kilogram of of you know well organized matter could be thrown out black and let it drift for a million years until it hits something else, that's a pretty small cost for a si si solar system wide civilization, right? But that's not sending people out and having look outside the control of the central government. So Stuart and I are both agreement that you know by this time we're talking everything's artificial. <laughs> So artificial creatures, even human M's could still fit in a kilogram of matter quite conveniently. Okay. It may be a million mm -hmm. AIs, I, that's a different matter, but I, I, I would claim confidently that a black kilogram rock thrown at high speed out of the solar system accurately toward another star system would be enough. Okay. Different assumption. I, I, I object to calling M's artificial. Uh, the you know, what we care about is the structure of cognition. We don't care about how sure. to realize the matter. I object to calling us artificial, but you know what? If we had our ancestors from 100,000 years ago around, that's what they would call us. We, for compared to them, we are pretty actually artificial. Our world, look at look around us. They would sell all this is fake. You've got paint on your walls. You're hiding the pipes. You're hiding the wires. You're just living in a fake world here. Okay. The, I mean, the reason why I th I'm going to, you know, I think this point is important is that when we say the expansion is by artificial entities, we're painting a vision of expansion into the universe that excludes us. That, uh, and that- I intend not, to be artificial. I'm quite eager to become artificial. That's, that's an, a future I would- Yeah, but, but, but I mean, that, I'm, I'm just trying to say, the terminology we use creates a framing that usually does not include us as artificial, but still being us as part of the expansion. So I just, I just you know, wanted to, to interject that reframing, but go ahead. I would actually love to hear a little bit more from both Stuart and uh, Robin about how you think AI will really interplay in our long-term expansion. I know that Stuart, you have entirely focused now on aligning AIs. And Robin, you clearly wrote Age of M, which uh, has been a quite influential uh, book in our community. Uh, and so I would love to um, know a little bit more in detail, like how do you see, um, you know, human uh, AI, AI alignment, the, the types of AIs that we can create and our long-term uh, expansion possibilities intersect if you can paint a scenario, maybe one that you think is um, desirable as well. Uh Okay. Um, as I was um, mentioning uh, there, the thing that struck me the most is how similar the challenge of getting AI alignment uh, seems to be to the challenge of making this expansion work with a framework that uh, is acceptable. So it's, uh, and I, my timelines for AIs have got a bit shorter uh, recently. I, uh, lots of people are in that case, <laughs> um, I feel, but, um, my timelines for AI have gotten a bit shorter. So it seems more and more likely to me that we are going to see a, um, AI transition of some type before we have any large scale expansion, uh, into the universe of any type, which means that, um, which means that the form of the AI transition, the form of the AIs we get starts to become very relevant. Because if it yeah. is the sort of say Eliezer style, Nick style, super intelligence that is aligned uh, in a garage um, kind of scenario and that acts with uh, basically uh, unrestrained power, then, then a lot of, um, a lot of what uh, uh, we're talking about becomes possible on the cosmic scale, and not only possible, but trivial and expected. If 
you have an AI capable of coordination uh, itself, and that one is capable of ensuring human flourishing and can copy itself and is currently running the earth, then this is what uh, you expect to see in the universe uh, as well. But if the AI transition takes a different form, if you get something that is a much more delocalized, um, maybe non-cooperative, but not where there's no intelligence that has a strategic advantage is some of the uh, Paul Cristiano scenarios, um, something closer to the age of M's, then that means that we'll have transitioned AI without having the tools uh, to ensure large-scale cooperation and without the likeliness of doing that. So there you can start getting expansion by entities, non-cooperative entities at an earlier date. So this is why I feel that the AI transition is probably, even if it's not the super intelligence in a box kind of scenario, how the AI transition happens is going to determine what's going to happen at the cosmic scale rather than other considerations. And could you speak just maybe in a few words, what exactly you're working on right now? Oh, um, we want to align AI with uh, human flourishing. <laughs> um, which means since I'm not very optimistic at defining everything in advance uh, on the grounds that A, it's very hard and B, it's impossible. Um, it's the, can you develop a way of extrapolating your values from current, so from current human values across all scenarios that you might encounter, what is an acceptable extrapolation of human values uh, that can be done. And if that succeeds, then a lot of other AI control methods become viable. So it's kind of like, yeah. just That's a very I short suggest pitch. You, can I suggest that you read our book? Um, because <laughs> the, the, central, the central thesis of that book is that entire mission conceived that way is misconceived, is wrong. Um, is the wrong way to go about this. Um, that the, if there's a hard takeoff where there's a single uh, uh, AI that goes through the, the um, uh, you know, this chain reaction and become, and comes to be a dictator over the world, there's some organization, there's some uh, entities that were there at the point of emergence. And no matter how aligned you and other philosophers design a goal structure such that that AI is aligned with long-term goals, there's no realistic political process I can imagine such that the goal structure that's, um, that's inserted into that AI at the point of takeoff is your benign goal structure. This, we're talking th this sudden permanent military takeover by the, of the world that happens at a particular point in time is a position of great power, of unprecedented power over the world, over everyone else. Positions of power attract those who want power. Um, and the, it seems to me that any kind of unitary takeover like that is game over. It's, 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 it's okay. the thing that we should be trying to avoid and that the way to Can avoid I? it. Oh, sorry. Yeah. The way to avoid it is, um, uh, within the soft takeoff scenario to keep in mind that there are many, not just that there are many different AIs, uh, but that they're interacting with each other in the cooperative framework of the global marketplace where each of them in trying to problem solve is, is within a situation of coexistence with others, problem solving for other goals, bringing about cooperation with each other. So you can get the recursive self-improvement and chain reaction takeoff for, you know, for okay. the civilization as a whole as humans become less 
of a bottleneck in the production loop. What, yes, what I'm, some of my thoughts is the, basically you don't get that for free. You have to aim for that. And part of what we're doing is aiming for that. And part of what we're doing is to ensure that if some of the more extreme scenarios, I did the sort of takeoff one day takeoff is not very likely, but the say you have this collective of AIs over a period of three years, which is an immense period for themselves. Is there, are they going to merge or cooperate? Is some entity amongst them going to achieve great power over them? It, it seems that you, I basically don't trust any way of restricting AI power that does not define in some sense, what power means for the AI and includes this in its motivation, or the very least includes what misuse of power is. Uh, yeah, so it, what I'm saying is I, what you're saying sounds lovely. We won't get it for free. Um, and some of what we're working on could help to make it happen, uh, but it'll require quite a lot of work. So it's not quite as, um, let's say, dis distinctive as like coherent extrapolated evolution, or is it trying to do something like that? Um, it's not the same. The, the fact that it um, has the same term extrapolation is somewhat misleading. Um, it's the, the idea here is instead of extrapolating the agent to infinity and saying, what would be the goals of that agent? You take the actual goals or preferences or values and you extrapolate them to some extent, uh, well, not to some extent across the uh, futures that are likely to happen. So if you design an AI to have limited power or only power in certain areas, such as preventing dangerous AIs or that kind of thing, that's relatively easy to define nowadays with uh, training data, which is never going to work, but you can define the basic concept. And then if the extrapolation process works, you can get that to extend in the case uh, where the AI becomes powerful, but I don't think we can count on markets to constrain the power of AIs because we just don't know how they will interact with each other and what great power they may achieve them, uh, um, that puts them out of the control of that, uh, scenario. I think we have to act on their goals and their motivations as well. If we want anything uh, like that to happen. Thank you. Well, that I think ties in maybe with another interesting, maybe distinction, even in uh, yours and Robin's thinking, which is on the fact that you think that values will eventually um, at least somewhat converge or at least like fall into a specific attractive states, right? And I think Robin, you wrote something on value drift a while back and, um, and it sounds like, you know, Robin, you may even be more critical that we can do something like an extrapolation of potential values across all scenarios. I'm not sure, but I'd love to hear your opinion. And also, what do you think about the long-term trajectories of AI as it's relevant for our future in space? So I read five chapters of the book uh, this afternoon before, including the chapter that's the session. And it's not a coincidence that I share a lot of Mark's concerns. Um, about AI in particular, I would just say AI is a name for a large category of tech. It's like referring to energy or shelter or transport or something. It doesn't necessarily have like a coherent internal structure such that you can advance all of energy or all of transport with some particular innovation. It's just a name for a large category. So I think that without like large central government world organizations doing otherwise, it would naturally be diverse internally. That is just like energy would have lots of different energy technologies and energy firms doing it in different ways for different customers, et cetera. And it would just advance all with a sort of relatively steady trajectory with some lumpy jumps once in a while. That's how we should think about AI too. It's just a, a name for a category 
there isn't the AI that gets invented or that happens at a moment. Naturally, it would just be lots of different firms having lots of different computer tech that has lots of different smartnesses slowly advancing altogether. That's what would naturally happen in a relatively deregulated, decentralized world. <laughs> that would be the trajectory of AI. But our world is not so decentralized or deregulated. <laughs> and uh, so, as, as I've said before, I am. I am concerned that the actual trajectory of world technology is heavily constrained by regulation at the moment and by desires to centralize control. And that's often done exactly on the rationales that Stuart gives where people say, oh, we couldn't allow unconstrained regulation and competition that would have problems X, Y, and Z. Therefore, we need these central powers to take, take over and manage it. And they do that a lot and it doesn't go that well, but <laughs> nevertheless, uh, that's how the world has been going for a while. And so my vision for the long term of AI is that if we would leave it alone, it would be okay. I think there's actually, you know, M's would vary and have descendants and AI would have descendants. And they would mix and vary and, and all of that would be complicated. We could say some interesting things about it, but I don't think it would actually be a problem uh, in general, except for the fact that people are want to grab control over it and want to make sure they make it go the way they want. And that's a big risk because in general, there are these big risks associated with central powers grabbing hold of these things. And again, you know, regulatory capture why by some particular group captures the regulators and moves it in their direction, uh, or just makes big mistakes or just prevents innovation. So, you know, honestly, nuclear power has been just dramatically hobbled for at least a half century because of vast over-regulation. If not for that vast regulation, we would live in an extremely different world right now with energy prices much cheaper than now. And that's a world we don't live in because it's been heavily over-regulated. And that could happen to AI too, in the sense of it could just be rastically slowed down due to regulation. Um, but so then the question, you know, the question as always is, uh, as always should be, if the world is told, oh, you can't trust this technology to evolve by itself, it needs these regulators. The question is, how can the world trust those regulators and the story they're telling about the problem they say exists and how they will fix it and how you can trust them to fix that well? That's exactly the problem the world should be asking about it. And those who propose to control and regulate AI, who say, you can't let it go uncontrolled. You need us to be in control. You need us to make it our way, the way we say will be safe. And the rest of us should say, I don't know about that. Can we really believe you? So I'm not anti all regulation. I just think on average, we go too far. People are too trusting. I, I certainly think there are many cases where regulation has been useful in the world, but this is the reasonable stance to ask about AI. And I have to say, when I've looked at AI, I'd say, I don't actually see the dangers that other people claim to see. So compared to like in a lot of other places of regulation, it looks to me likely to be over-regulated. Yeah, there's another interesting part, I think that <clears throat> also ties into uh, into that a little bit, which is also what someone had suggested we uh, touch touch um, touch about in the chat, which is um, the long term future uh, of human evolution. I think Nick Buster wrote uh, a paper on the long term evolution of uh, humanity, um, in which he is suggesting a race to the bottom. And I think in H of M, you kind of paint at least a world in which there is a race to subsistence, but it's not necessarily with suffering. And so maybe we can also tackle that a bit because it was uh, previously uh, yeah, at least suggested in the chat. So maybe if you think about this more deregulated world, right, and um, how could it play out? Should we be worried about those sure. entities sure. suffering? Well, on certainly one of the biggest arguments people have given for regulation is population. They have said unregulated world will have a population explosion that will eventually produce a collapse of wages down to subsistence wages. They say that's a terrible scenario. Therefore, we need to regulate population. And that's that's been a common argument for a long time. Um, Age of M is a world where, where I describe what happens when population is unregulated and, and it drastically expands and wages do fall to subsistence levels. But looking at this world overall, I don't think it's such a bad world. And I don't think I would prefer the world where you prevented it from happening. I mean, the counterfactual world where you limit wages to say current human wages and M's can only earn those wages. I would say there's a factor of 10 or a hundred fewer M's in that world. And they're doing much less interesting things. And I like this world better where they, they do a lot more things and they mostly enjoy their lives. So I actually I, just don't think fundamentally subsistence wages is a terrible thing for a human mind to live under in an advanced economy where most jobs are you know, mental jobs and there's a lot of specialization and there's just a virtual reality is cheap and you can have a, you know, enjoyable 
luxurious experiences in your off hours, uh, it doesn't look like such a bad world to me. Except that you have admitted that this would quickly evolve away from any human-like entity. We're talking about a world where you have no choice whatsoever. When you're operating at subsistence, you do what needs to be done. It's a world without freedom, without choice. What? Without so, you're, so that's survival. the forager move, right? You're saying the farmer world where people just have to do what's competitive, that's not a world of choice because choice is where we all get together, we have a committee and we vote and we all decide together how the world goes. And that's in the forager's mind. The only kind of freedom is where we make a collective choice about things as opposed to letting individuals choose what they want in the context of a world that gives them limited options. In a context of a world where there is only one option. Because we're it's going for one, the, most the limited options. Come on. No, no. We're going for efficiency. We're going for maximal efficiency. We're living at the but, sustainable. So, so even in biology, animals have choice. choice, right? L look at yeah. actual actual foxes out in the wild. I saw a couple came to my yeah, window a few days ago. Because they have is choices. Inefficient. They they can go left or right. They can sleep now or walk walk around now. Foxes in the wild have choices and always have. It's because not because evolution is inefficient. World. So sorry. And it will continue to be inefficient. Yes. It will not. It will go for the most efficient say no. Evolution will apply to evolution itself. I, I think there's an optical illusion here. Uh, efficient at what? And when we reason selectively, we're reasoning about what phenomenon we should expect to come to dominate the system according to some measure. And depending on what measure we choose, we will define uh, efficiency, uh, fitness in terms of re you know, reproducing or growing with regard to that measure. But different ways of measuring the world will find different things being selected for. And the world itself is not, um, it does not privilege any one such measure. So uh, I think that we're going to have a very, very diverse world. There'll be many pockets of surplus. And yes, for each way of measuring the world, uh, most of the mass of the world by that measure will be efficient. But the size of the inefficient world operating in the surplus can be trillions of times the size of our entire world today. Um, uh, so, so I think we need to be careful how we reason from selection and efficiency. Just also know your psychology was evolved for a world that was highly evolved. That is the degree of variation and freedom and spontaneity that you find comfortable and, and freedom and lively life fulfilling is the degree of freedom and variation that evolved among our ancestors. That was a world of, you know, a million years of heavy, strong selection, and you are the result of that. So uh, you can't say that, you know, the things that your intuition wants in the world are at, at fundamentally at odds with evolution because they are the result of evolution. They were well matched to it. They are the result of being in the dream time, as you put it, we're out of sync with evolution. This is why we can enjoy those things. But I mean, is there any difference enjoy, between what you're on, describing? Hold on, between... hold, on. We're, we're, hold on. We're in the dream time for a few centuries. People enjoyed their lives for millions of years before the dream time. Um, okay. Uh, that is a valid point. But what I'm saying is that we are, we are out of sync with evolution and evolution is is not very efficient. The foxes should not exist. Humans should not exist. Entities capable of reasoning should not exist. We're far too complicated. This is not what evolution, this is because of the inefficiency of evolution that everything that we value exists. Entities Human capable beings, of reasoning will definitely entities. be a part of the future evolutionary mix. The question is just how big a part. And again, the other question is like, if you authorize some organization to take control to prevent what would otherwise be this evolution and to instead substitute its centralized administrative outcome, how bad could that go? That's the key. Choice. I have not, I have not uh, said that that is what should happen. In fact, I think that our approach is one of the few ways that might prevent that from happening. 
because as I say, you don't get algorithms cooperating with each other and limiting their own power for free. You're painting a scenario that may happen, but this is making vast assumptions about what AI's power will be that most people in this area disagree with you. With. So Stuart, what is your ask? That is, you're going to ask the rest of us to, to authorize you to have some, you and your associates to have some control over something to make things go the way you want. What is the ask? What is the thing you ask of us to, to defer to you on such that things will go well the way you want them to go? That, well, that our approach, which we will have tested and shown is successful at extrapolating whatever input human values are to uh, more complicated scenarios. That if we define what limited power is, that this can extrapolate it and maintain the limited power even as the AI gets much more complicated. We're, we're not gonna keep it a secret, uh, ultimately. It's gonna be, this is the You're gonna have an approach, you write a paper, and you wanna build to be passed by some organization that will authorize your approach to be required or subsidized or something somewhere, right? That that. In the end, that has to come down to that. You're, you're talking about how, no, it does not have to come, uh, down to that at all. How many more would you be adopted if how, not that way? Okay. How long do you have? Uh, do we, do, do you want me to use the remaining 16 minutes to go through various scenarios? I mean, it's about an ask, right? In some sense, you want to ask us, ask something of us to make your approach half. If you don't have a simple ask, that's a problem right there, right? If your answer of what we need to do to make your thing happen is a half hour essay, that's already a problem. Okay. Well, it's because of the multiple scenarios that could happen. If there is somebody saying, I am creating a super intelligent AI in my basement and it will take over the world. Um, and for some reason I believe them, um, then it would be, please add this to it and point it towards, uh, here, liberal human values, that'll be good enough. Go with that um, because it's happening in an hour and that's a disaster uh, if you don't do something along those lines. But I don't think that that's going to happen. If you get other scenarios with more gradual increase in AI power, then you can have more gradual uh, use. We can have more gradual use of the technology, use of the extrapolation to get the algorithms to do what their designers intend to do. And if anybody's not inclined to take your approach, what is your ask about those people? What do you want us to do about the people who are we, not inclined to take your approach? Well, it depends. Okay. Again, if this person is going to unleash the super intelligent AI that takes over the world and kills everyone, then stop them. If the, what is more likely they're, they're doing a gradual increase in power while others were doing increase in power with more aligned machines, that'll probably, um, sort itself out. It's not, I, I want to be able to move away from the, um, you have to get the, the sort of, you have to enforce rules around the world or the AI transition probably dooms us. So your technology will give us a good outcome, even if only 20, 10% of people apply your approach. All the other AIs, 90% don't do it. Your, your thing will still work out fine? It depends on which 10% do it and other details of how, how the thing happens. How many, how many cooperators do you need in a market to make the market endure? And how many people would voluntarily add it to make it and, uh, it, eh, as part, if this was known to make your AI cooperative and trustworthy in a market. So it sounds like if it was the oh, first 10% oh. and the most powerful 10%, that might work out just fine. It's the, the most powerful 10% or the first 10% or some of the, the, the reason why I was talking about a long essay is because there are many different scenarios and in each of the scenarios, there's a slightly different approach. Um, and the, the kind of best thing about value extrapolation is that it's somewhat adequate rather than perfect in that it doesn't need everything to align, uh, exactly. So 
the the, the sort of thing where it fails yeah. is if if you can only get a badly aligned and AI to do the sort of super intelligence explosion. If that's the case, then there's pretty much no, not much solution except for, I don't know, very nasty surveillance and clamping down on that. But I yeah, don't you, think that that is the most likely scenario at all. So we won't need to do anything like that. We in, in I mean, the like time, time. This, please go. No, was it you, Blake, who want to speak? Oh no, we had oh, sure. and Blake. Yeah, I wanted to ask something, uh, just just to square up a bit of what I'm hearing from Stuart on one side, and then I'd say like Mark and Robin, I'm sitting on sort of the other side. Um, and Stuart, you're saying something like, we don't get that for free, right? Like market mechanisms sort of uh, sorting out the problem might happen, but we don't get for free, which I appreciate. But I don't know if that's uh, quite what the, the matter is here. It seems to me that if I were to represent Robin and Mark here, correct me, uh, if, if needed, that they would not say that we're getting that for free, but they would say that we need to think of the AI's, um, the power that it has, not just as being purely technological in nature, but as being embedded within a power structure and within a market structure. And right. And so, no, indeed, it won't come for free. <laughs> um, and and you won't you won't even get it just by tweaking the models a bit or tweaking the the, the tech itself. You're going to have to look into those power structures that that they're embedded inside and get it to happen, but get it to happen in a, in a larger space than just purely um, machine-based world. Did I represent people so, correctly here? You've, you've represented me correctly. I want, to, you know, want to amplify one aspect of this, which, which is sort of, again, sort of the central thesis of the book is that this embedding into our current civilization uh, that enables multiple goals to be pursued cooperatively does align it with human values and human needs in a way that Stuart doing research and trying to write down goal structures will never be able to match. This whole notion that some philosophers can write down a utility function or a goal structure that represents what humans value is the central planning fallacy re recapitulated in, in, you know, with, with, you know, you know, new new terminology and cast new technology, but it's it's the same central planning fallacy. Human goals and human needs are incredibly distributed and diverse, and it's this structure of voluntary interaction and the richness of the civilization that emerge from it, which you're not going to be able to capture and recapitulate in some goal structure you write down. Stuart, I fully agree. With you. I fully agree with Mark. I just wanted to mention that. And that's why we're not trying to do that. Yeah, just, I, I think just to have it on the record, um, you know, what you already said on the chat here as well, you're trying to create tools for having folks do that properly. So, I'm sorry, if uh, I should let, I have one more, I have one more thing to say on this theme, but, but if anybody, I can wait until other people talk. We have one more haste rant, but um, waste hand, sorry, but I think that, you know, you're already on the thread. Okay. The, um, the thing that scares me about a lot of AI alignment research, I want to cast in a metaphor of a process that I saw at Google, which is Google used to have the slogan, don't be evil. And the result was that the employees believe that they weren't evil. In fact, of course, most employees were not evil. Um, and, but the result was that they did not stop themselves from enabling Google through Gmail in particular to become this tremendous centralization of powers. Google has plain text access to the email of billions of people. Uh, and that centralized vulnerability becomes something that less well-inclined powers outside Google can, can take advantage of, can abuse. My, my fear of a lot of this AI alignment research is that imagining 
that benevolent philosophers will be able to install this aligned goal structure into the AI, they imagine that what we should do is bring about the emergence of AI in a way that we could so control it. And, and once you've, if AI emerges in a way that is controllable in that way, it will not be controlled in a benign manner. I will also let Zoom user ask their question. You're muted. Hey, Joel Dietz here. Yeah, just a quick question for Stuart. Do you have something like a ranked list of all of the possible outcomes uh, by their likelihood? And then, you know, if you did have something like that, and ideally with supporting evidence for why you think there's a certain likelihood for a certain outcome, you could potentially design the solutions that, you know, at least mitigate some of the more likely outcomes. Um, I don't have such a rank list. Uh, I used to, at the FHI, look at probabilities quite intensely, um, but I kind of dropped that in recent years because I realized that whatever the scenario, the work that I was doing was likely to be important. And that, um, yes, basically the expected utility of it is good enough, uh, that I didn't need precise, uh, utilities, uh, precise probabilities, but also I'm not thinking that I am going to solve all the problems of AI across the world. Um, what I'm trying to do is build general tools and methods that allows you to scale the uh, the goals that you give to AIs safely as the AI's power increases. That is, uh, what the aim is. And there's a lot of people like Gov AI and, uh, this book itself who are looking at various scenarios of what you could do with that. If you could ensure that the AI that you're designing will not go either minorly wrong or catastrophically wrong or existentially wrong. Uh, as it uh, gains in power, there I don't have the solution to politics. <laughs> I have my own opinions, but they're not uh, particularly any better than others. But there are a lot of people doing work in here, and these tools will be generally useful for almost all scenarios of um, uh, that could arrive in AI, including maybe some, uh, some of them that are more negative, uh, as well. They would be, it would be better to have them in the world, in that world, even if the outcome is not ideal with existential catastrophes are the, uh, uh, are the other option. But the main thing that I want is that this enables a lot of the positive scenarios that we've been talking about today to happen. Uh, because I don't think that they are going to happen. Well, I've said it, <laughs> they're not happening for free. We have to build on them. Um, you, yeah, if you want cooperation, um, we need something that scales, um, uh, that stays cooperative, uh, as it gets more powerful. And that's, that's the key bit that we're focusing on. Yeah, I'm not sure if I already took the last question away here, but maybe as yes, we also move to Robin, and if you want to chime in afterwards, as do please go ahead. It's just you know whether you're rather optimistic or pessimistic about the long term future, and if given you know your assumptions, your specific action recommendations or suggestions um, that people you know can kind of implement in their daily lives already as we move towards that future. So how can we bring it basically from the very very far future? Uh, into the more immediate present and maybe Robin, well, you want to go first, including saying what you wanted to say when you raised your hand. Uh, right. So I, I want to make a, just a bunch of brief points, uh, relevant here. So, so basically, um, in the past technologies have all had like things that could go wrong with them. And, uh, we've always paid attention to problems and trying to prevent them and deal with them, but we've pretty much always done that usefully when we had relatively concrete versions that we could look at and figure out the things that could go wrong with what we could do with. So I'm 
relatively skeptical about taking a very abstract description of a technology car category like AI like and trying to anticipate the future things that could happen in systems that you haven't seen concrete versions of in front of you, like trying to think in the year 1500, how to deal with cars or nuclear weapons or submarines or things, it would just not have been very productive back then. And in addition to like, if you're too early, you can't be very useful. There's just the huge opportunity cost of resources. If you spend them later, instead of now you get to, you know, put them in the bank and they get to grow. And I'd say, if you want to look at like tech things, problems that you could work on that will have long-term relevance, but that are realized now that you could work on, I would just say governance is just this big category of problems. And we have a familiar set of governance mechanisms, but there's this vast space of other governance mechanisms that can be explored and that haven't been much explored. And the blockchain world is exploring some of those. And I have some other ideas, but I just say, work concretely on governance problems, do small scale experiments, apply those to the organizations and problems that we have. And then when we have AI and world government and all those things in the future, advances in governance will be very useful then. Just two words on the types of governance frameworks that you want to I put in the ring is decision markets or yeah, decision markets are my, still my favorite category of, of things that deserve a lot more experiments or lots, you could do lots of experiments in the small organizations to explore applications of decision markets. And they would, in fact, if those small scale experiments played out, be a useful thing to do to manage AI risk, you know, universe exploration, all sorts of big world problems could be usefully dealt with, with decision markets. If only we had sort of worked out the kinks. Wonderful. Stuart. <laughs> Uh, yes. Well, um, I'm thinking that given the amount of resources um, devoted to pushing AI along compared with the amount of resources to ensure even sort of midterm or short-term safety, uh, that it's not unreasonable to get uh, quite a lot of, to get some people working on aligning this. And there are strong I mean, I'm sympathetic to Robin's view that AI may turn out to be less of a ch game changer than other than people think, that it can be usefully grouped with other categories of technologies in the past. But I'm, it's, I'm more sympathetic to the idea that entities capable of their own planning of thinking better than humanity, than humans itself, and maybe the entirety of humanity, uh, that these kind of entities are a game changer on a sufficient level that they can't be usefully grouped with other uh, technologies in the past. And we can't just assume that we'll sort it out somehow the way that we always have before. And on the point of not not wasting resources too early. I'm trying to design if everything we're doing in the company is to the maximum model agnostic, and it could be used in the most broadest design of algorithms as possible. Um, and now getting back to the long-term future, I, so I think the AI transition is going to come sooner than mass space expansion becomes relevant. And I think that the way that we navigate the AI transition is going to determine the form of the space expansion. And I think that there is going to be, so if we survive that uh, with humanity uh, of some form left over, I think that we'll, there will be some cooperative framework exported across the universe because that'll be what will be necessary to survive on earth. And then with these algorithms, it'll then be implementable across the vast scales in a decentralized way, uh, of course, but across the vast scales of space, if it can be done uh, in algorithms on earth. So actually I'd say surprisingly positive on average, maybe a 10% chance of everything is doomed um, a 5% extra chance of some really nasty equilibrium developing, uh, under some say a really nasty world government or some really nasty evolutionary outcome. Um, and that's a little bit more percentage of okay scenarios, but a significant chunk on, yes, this, the future will be great.
Well, that seems pretty chipper and a very great way to end the meeting. Thank you both so much for staying two hours. We usually ask our speakers to join one and then often they stay for two hours and it's uh, really wonderful. So thanks a lot for leading in to such a long session, not only to you, but to everyone who uh, came not only for this meeting, but many of the other meetings before that. It was really, really wonderful to hear your opinions. And, you know, we really barely scratched the surface of many of the areas that you work on also as it pertains to the topics that we cover in the book. Um, so thanks a lot for giving us your time. Thank you everyone for joining. I had a really few wonderful weeks um, meeting everyone on Sundays to discuss different chapters of the book. And, you know, as I think we have said multiple times, this book is uh, like a good game here to be iterated. And um, it's kind of a pretty quirky book in the sense that it's continuously evolving. Uh, also, thanks to your contribution. So we had good coin bounties out. Many of you answered them uh, on how to improve different chapters. Thank you for that. Um, and yeah, we will mingle and discuss next steps as follow-ups from the book. We just gave a talk on the book at Protocol Labs, the Funding the Commons event in New York, and we will have a workshop, which is more on the cryptographic tools that um, we, um, we at least surface in the book in October in San Francisco, um, which is more a technical workshop. Uh, and then, you know, we'll be in touch about next steps. The book will also be, soon be available um, online. And I just want to thank you all. Uh, it was really, really fantastic. And thanks a lot. Um, it was wonderful. And I don't think it was the last time we all saw each other in this format. Given all of your comments, I'm sure the next iteration of the book is already on the, underway. Um, and yeah, I hope you have a wonderful rest of your Sunday. And thanks everyone for joining. It's really lovely.